Good morning, everyone. Glad everybody's here this morning. Ryan is going to continue in his uh, lessons given to us about God and his. And I think today we're going to talk a little bit more about the creation and being a creator. I tried to pick some of our songs that talked not only about the creation of, of Earth, but also a lot of times we think about the creation here, but we also do remember that he also created heaven. He's created everything, heaven and earth. So he's created everything. So there is, even our last song talks about that. We're looking forward to going to a place that he's made for us. So um, our first song, though, um, after I read Psalms 9, 1, and 2, we'll talk a little bit more about the creation and, what, and praising God and how that creation itself actually praises God, the creation of God. Psalms 9, 1 through 2 reads like this. I will give thanks unto Jehovah with all my heart. I will show forth all thy marvelous works. I will be glad and exalt in thee. I will sing praise to thy name, O thou most high. And the writer here talks about God being the most high, Jehovah, and his marvelous works. And him showing others around them that those works. <laughs> The first song will be Hallelujah, Praise Jehovah. And you'll see what I'm talking about, about the creation. If you look, look at the words in this song, the creation actually praises God as we sing this song. <clears throat> Hallelujah, praise Jehovah, from the heavens praise His name, praise Jehovah. Oh, you hear? 
that we might on a daily basis serve you in an acceptable manner. Father, we don't know really truly how to give you the glory to you that you deserve. Help us, Father, to recognize that indeed you are God, that you're the creator of this world, and that you keep it moving and working for us. Be with us, Father, as we go through this time together this morning. Be with Ryan that he might show your glory to us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. The next song is Walking Along at Eve. Uh, look in the song, it's 874. <clears throat> and in this song, um, if you'll notice, it's, it does talk about that same thing about the things around us. <clears throat> the things that we do every day, and then looking forward to heaven and looking forward to those things that we're going to be, be doing with God later in our, after this world is done. <clears throat> Walking alone at even, viewing the skies afar, bidding the darkness come to welcome each silver star. I have a great delight in the wonderful scenes above. God in His power and might is showing His truth and love. Oh, for a home with God, a place in His courts to rest. Shown in a safe abode with Jesus and the blessed. Savior's love, where I'll be pure and whole and live with my God above. Sitting alone at evening, dreaming the hours away, watching the shadows falling now at the close of day. Oh. 
And God, part of the Jordan for Joshua, just as he part of the Red Sea for Moses some 40 years plus before. When they finished passing over the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Take 12 men from the people, from each tribe a man, and command them, saying, Take 12 stones from here, out of the midst of the Jordan, from the very place where the priest's feet stood firmly, and bring them over with you, and lay them down in the place where you lodge tonight. Then Joshua called the 12 men from the people of Israel, whom he had appointed, a man from each tribe. And Joshua said to them, Pass on before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan, and take up each of you a stone upon his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the people of Israel, that this may be a sign among you. When your children ask in time to come, what do these stones mean to you? Then you shall tell them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it passed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. So these stones shall be to the people of Israel a memorial forever. What were those 12 stones? They were a reminder so that they could remember the passing through the dry ground for the Jordan River flow. They were visible. And then God tells Moses to tell her, Joshua to tell him, this is a teaching moment. This is an object lesson so that you can teach your children. So again, what is the purpose? It's to remember. And I think you know where I'm going with this. Paul, in 1 Corinthians 11, quotes Jesus twice as saying, as he is giving the Lord's Supper for the first time, after the bread, Jesus told the apostles, do this in remembrance of me. After the cup, he said again, do this in remembrance of me. So think about this as a memorial and compare it to some of the memorials we've talked about. This one is simple. Guys, I don't know about you, but I didn't want to have to go out in a parking lot where I get a stone. You know, one stone for each family. You have to do that every week and fill a building with rocks. It's simple. It's accessible. Everybody can participate in the bread and the fruit of the vine. It also is a teaching moment. This is an object lesson to help us remember something very, very important. And it's a frequent reminder. For us, we do it once a week. In Acts, it looks like some of the early Christians actually shared the Lord's Supper together daily. Again, like I said, there was no headstone for Jesus. There was an empty tomb, and there was a promise to return. So as we look at this memorial this morning, let's remember Jesus. Let's remember what he has done for us and what he has promised to do in the future as we share in his memorial. At this time, Jerry and I will pass the bread. God and Father in heaven, we, we thank you so much for the gift of your Son. And Jesus, we thank you for this simple memorial that each week allows us to remember what you have done for us. As we share this bread, Father, remind us that this body, the body of Jesus, hung on a cross so that we might find life. Bless this bread. And bless those of us as we partake it together. In Jesus' name, amen.
Our dear Heavenly Father, we're also mindful of this memorial of the blood of the Son of Jesus, your Son of Jesus, as he shed here on the cross. And Father, remind us that this blood seals the covenant. It gives us access to your grace, your mercy, your forgiveness, and the promise of eternal life with you. Bless this cup and bless those of us as we share it together. In Jesus' name, amen. opportunity to show our love to you by giving back a small portion of what you have given us. We pray that you'll bless this gift and bless those who use these things with wisdom to do what's best for the kingdom in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Song after the lesson will be Mansion Over the Hilltop. Um, after Ryan gives us our lesson, and, and our song before the lesson is Our God He Is Alive. It's on page 25. When we sing this song, uh, just like we did our memorial service that we did, that Ken just led us through, we're affirming that we believe that Jesus died for us, Amen. that He's coming back for us, and just like we sing this song, we believe that our God is alive. There's so many people out in this world that don't even think about God. They, they think he's dead. He's gone. We've heard those things, you know, in the world that we live in. But us as Christians, we affirm when we sing this song. This is one of the most beautiful songs, I think, ever written. And it, uh, it tells those who sing it and those that hear it what we think about and what we're looking forward to in one day. <clears throat> 
There is beyond the azure blue a God concealed from human sight. He tinted skies with heavenly hue and framed the world with His great light. There is a God, He is alive, in Him we live. Somehow it's, it's, it's prideful to think that we can understand God. And certainly it would be uh, the ultimate in hubris to think that we can fully understand God. But as we saw last week, the scriptures show us that we ought to be trying to understand God. That God has revealed a lot about himself in his creation, in his word, in our hearts. And therefore that we have an obligation, an expectation that we will try to understand him and understand what he's revealed to us. And so last week we took a look at God. Um, and we took, took a look at what I call the big three omnis about God. The, his omnipotence, his omniscience, and his omnipresence. And in particular, we looked at God and some of the names of God. And one of those names, El Shaddai, one of the most common names used particularly in the Old Testament, 
which refers to God, and it was, it was the, God, the way that God identified himself to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob as El Shaddai, the all-sufficient God, or sometimes it's translated as God Almighty. And you can see that this week I managed to sort out my text issues so that all the, the words are actually on the same page when you look at them. So that's kind of exciting for us. But, but El Shaddai, the notion of the all-sufficient God, speaks particularly to God's omnipotence, but it also speaks to his omniscience and his omnipresence as well. But when we think about omnipotence and we think about creation, which is what we're going to be talking about today, we see over in Acts chapter 17, and we saw this last week, we looked at this last week, Paul speaking to the, to the Athenian people says, the God who made the world and all things in it, since he is the Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. And he has made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation, that they would seek God, if perhaps they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. And in him are so for in him we live and move and exist, even as some of your own poets have said, for we also are his children. Being then the children of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and thought of man. And so we're studying the divine nature in this study. And what we're going to look at today is in the beginning, that notion of creation and God as the creator of all things. And what we want to kind of try to understand is what creation tells us about God as the creator, what it means that God is the creator. And we're going to look at three particular aspects or, or perspectives on God as the creator as we go through this. And we're going to be looking at Psalm 104 as we go through this. If you want to turn over there, you're going to find I'm going to be taking bits and pieces out of it. You may want to kind of read through that as we go along just to kind of see the big picture of everything that the psalmist says. But over in Psalm 104, the psalmist says, speaking of God, of course, he set the earth on its foundations. It can never be moved. You covered it with the watery depths as with a garment. The water stood above the mountains. But at your rebuke, the waters fled. At the sound of your thunder, they took to flight. They flowed over the mountains. They went down into the valleys to the place you assigned for them. You set a boundary that they cannot cross. Never again will they cover the earth. And this is speaking of creation. This could also be referring to the flood and what happens after the flood. But in this particular case, in the context, he's clearly speaking about creation. And specifically about the idea that God is the one who set up the earth. And then in the, in, the, in the Genesis story, we see that God separates out the waters. That there's the earth is basically just sort of a ball of mud. And God separates out the waters and puts some of them in the sky, puts most of them on the, on the, on the, the earth, and then moves them so that the land is separated from the seas. And that's what this, this author is talking about, is that God was the one who did all of those things. And he did those things by simply speaking those things. And so the first aspect of God as creator that I want us to understand is that God is the author of creation. God is the author. Now, when we think about authors, usually we think about somebody writing things down. But the notion of speaking something and making that word become reality, that's authorship. That's, that's the, the creation of something out of nothing, which is what writing is in a lot of ways. You have ideas in your head, you write them down, now you have something on the page. Well, God does you one better than that. He doesn't just put words down on the page, he makes actual things out of nothing. And that's what the Genesis story talks about. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. And then God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness, and God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, one day, or the first day, depending on your translation. What's interesting here is that as the author of creation, God calls the light into existence, just as he will go on to call the you know, the water into existence or to separate them out, that he will call the stars and the moon and the sun into specific existence, that he will call vegetation into existence, and then birds and fish and animals on the land. He's going to call all those things into existence. But notice what else he does. He names those things. As the author, he has the right to give those things names, and so he calls them darkness and light, and he assigns words and ideas to the concepts of what he's creating there. And so we see that God is not just creating 
in a vacuum. I guess in one sense he is creating in a vacuum, but, but he's not just creating and just, just sticking things out there, that there's a purpose to this, that there's a design to this, and that there, is a, 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 an, I, there are ideas that are behind this and that are even bigger than what he's actually creating. Over in Hebrews chapter 11, the Hebrew writer says, By faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that were visible. In other words, God didn't have to start with something. There's a joke that talks about uh, scientists who figured out how to make life out of dirt. They, 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 they got dirt and they put the right chemicals together with it, and something living came out of that. And the scientists say to God, look, we have found out how to create life. We can do the same thing that you can do. And God says, really? Show me. And they say, okay, here's the dirt. And God says, no, no, get your own dirt. <laughs> because, because God didn't start with something. He didn't need something to fashion and make into the creation. He created everything out of nothing. There was no physical, material world until God spoke it into existence. And then he formed what was in existence after he made those things. He formed them into the shapes and the things that we have now. Over in Psalm 33, the psalmist says, By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth all their hosts. So God isn't like a carpenter. He doesn't have to take up his hammer and saw and go physically do things. His word is sufficient, coupled with that power that he has, to make those things happen. Now, a lot of times the tendency when we think about the creation is to think about it in terms of God's omnipotence, that he's all-powerful. And that's not wrong, obviously. The fact that he's all-powerful is what drives the creation. But we need to realize that God has some other characteristics that we looked at last week, in particular omniscience. How many of you remember what I said omniscience means last week? None of you, no. <laughs> somebody tell me, somebody tell me, what does omniscience mean? <clears throat> All know it, okay? And if you notice there, omniscience is made up of two parts. Omni, which is the all part, and science, which is the knowing part. Now, a lot of times there's this tendency to think that the word of God is somehow contradictory to or in conflict with science. Well, what's interesting is that built right into one of the fundamental characteristics of God is the idea that science is what he is. That he is the ultimate scientist, that he understands the things that he's creating. And so we're going to be talking a little bit today, I, I know some of you are not going to like this, we're going to talk about a little science as we go along today, as well as talk to about the horses. Yeah, there you go, there's the scientist over there. So, so here's one of the things I want you to understand about creation, or about the beginning of the universe. The primary modern day scientific idea about how the universe came about is called the Big Bang Theory. And the Big Bang Theory, and it's gone through a series of different models, but the current model that, 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 op, that they're operating off of is that initially what happened, what the, 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 the nature of the universe, the existence of the universe initially was a basically what's called a singularity, a compressed ball or, or, or thing made up of all of the energy and all of the matter in the universe in a state of total disorder, basically just all of it jumbled in there together in, in this total chaotic state. And then at some point, something happened within that state, what is commonly referred to as a quantum fluctuation, which means we don't really know. Um, it's a very fancy word for that, but it means we don't really know. Quantum fluctuation, because the word quantum basically speaks to things that are too small for us to actually perceive them. So by its very nature, we're saying we don't really know. Something happened, and it caused that singularity to explode, and all of that matter and energy basically expanded outward, and two really important things happened. One of those things was that outward expansion and that, 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 that energy and matter that's moving outward to form all of the different things that we see and that we experience. But the other thing that's really important, in some ways the most important thing, is that something happened that caused all of that total chaos to turn into a state of, of tremendous order so that there's order throughout the universe and that the universe will gradually become more and more ordered as stars and galaxies and planets form and order comes out of it. Now here's the interesting thing. There are three laws of thermodynamics that people who understand thermodynamics much better than I do have put out there. They are absolute in our physical universe. All of them basically say this is how things happen as long as you have a closed system, in other words a system that nobody is adding things to. And the second law of thermodynamics says that in a closed system everything tends towards chaos over time. Chaos means something a little bit different when it comes to thermodynamics than what, what we might think of. Chaos isn't like little kids running around acting like maniacs. That's a different kind of chaos. Chaos has to do with how efficiently energy can be used. 
So if you eat something for breakfast, you get calories out of that, some kind of food or something like that. If you go do a bunch of jumping jacks, you expend that energy that you've eaten and you use it up. Now, when you ate those things, the, the food that made up those calories, that was in an ordered state, a state in which you could put it into your body and make use of it. But once you do those jumping jacks, you're going to get hot, if you do enough of them at least. And that heat is heat that is energy that can never be used again. It's now, or, or it can be perhaps in some ways, but, but essentially what happens is that that energy is no longer useful anymore. It has become disordered in, es in essence. And every single thing that every single person, every single star, every single bit of, of, of all of creation, everything that it does uses up energy. Now the energy stays around, it just transforms into other forms that are no longer useful anymore. But you can start to see what the problem is here, is that over time, the total amount of energy that's ordered and available for use in the universe is going to go down and down and down and down. And that's just the nature of reality, and in fact, that isn't at all incompatible with the Bible. What is problematic, is, though, is that there's no principle of science that suggests that you can take a situation that's completely disordered, in which the energy and matter is totally useless, and suddenly make it massively ordered so that all those things can happen afterwards. Even if you, what happens when you blow things up? Do they become more ordered or less ordered in general? I mean, we, we kind of know, you know, they, 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 nothing, nothing comes out of a blast in better shape than it started, you know? The, the reality is that the, the problem, the single biggest problem with the Big Bang is that you need a massive injection of order that doesn't have any physical way of happening under the systems and processes that we understand. And that's coupled with the fact that we also need something to cause a singularity to turn into, to do something different than it was otherwise doing. And what's fascinating is that when you think about that scientific set of facts, in the context of what we see in the, in, in the creation of God, you see the potential and the place where what causes that change is the Word of God. And where that order comes from, because it has to come from outside the system, is from the God who does not exist within our system or is not bound and limited by our system, but rather can put order into whatever he wants. And so what's fascinating to me when you look at the creation, and by the way, most Big Bang scientists will not try to explain to you what caused those things to happen. They are simply talking about the processes. We have the answer to what caused those things to happen. Now, the additional fact that we know, which is the other answer that scientists can't answer, which is, where did the stuff come from in the first place? We have that answer, too. God made that, and then he made those things happen with it. He created the order. And the, and the story of the Genesis creation is all about God imposing order on a universe that is chaotic. And so what's fascinating when we look at this is we realize that God, as the author, is writing his order onto this disordered universe that he began with. And so one of the principles that we see and that's really important for us to understand about God as the creator is that God is a God of order. God is not a God of chaos. He creates order. And that's an important thing to remember. The second thing I want us to understand is the ingenuity of God. Going back to Psalm 104, starting in verse 24, the psalmist says, How many are your works, O Lord? In wisdom, you made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. There is the sea, vast and spacious, teeming with creatures beyond number, living things both large and small. The psalmist says, you understand creation, the things that you've made in a way that we don't understand them. You made up these things out of your mind and created them and made them. And so what we want to understand out of this is that God is the inventor. We, we invent things from time to time. An author invents ideas, but, but, but people come up with new ideas on a regular basis. It's actually one of the things that we see where we are like God in certain ways. I don't mean to make like we're like God in the sense that we're exalted like him, but we have his characteristics in us. We, are, we, we invent things, and God is the ultimate inventor. Realize that everything that exists in the universe and everything about the way that the universe works, there were no rules for that. There wasn't like a guidebook that God was looking at. There wasn't the Ikea directions for putting your furniture together. God didn't have something like that. God envisioned in his mind what creation should look like, and then he spoke it into existence. He invented all of those rules. He invented everything about 
how it looks. And, and, and there's a guy, Job, who decided to ask some questions of God about God's righteousness and what God was thinking. And God points out to him just how stupid those questions are by making reference to his understanding, God's understanding, that is, as the creator. We see this over in Job chapter 38. And we're going to kind of jump through that chapter the same way we are with the psalm a little bit here. But, but, but God says to Job, after Job has questioned him about whether he's done the right thing and taking all of Job's stuff away from him, even though Job was a righteous man. Job, God says to Job, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who set its measurements, since you know, or who stretched the line on it? On what were its bases sunk, or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? God starts out right off by saying, do you have any idea what I did when I laid down the foundations of the earth? When I created these basic ideas, and that's a direct reference, <coughs> excuse me, that's a direct reference to that omniscience that we're talking about. God's understanding of what he was doing. He doesn't have to try and, and error. He doesn't have to like work it out and it doesn't work out, so he has to try it again. He understands how it works. He built those things into it. He continues on and he says, have you entered the springs of the sea or walked in the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been revealed to you, or have you seen the gates of deep darkness? It's interesting, because when we talk about the oceans, scientists generally agree that we know less about the oceans than we do about outer space, because there's so much in there, and it's so deep, and it's so complicated, because we just don't know. But God knows all of those things. God built them. He created them. He understands what's in them. He, he understands all the animals that are in them. What's interesting here is that, this, the, 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 that God is also suggesting to Job that he created death. That death is a natural and necessary part of the creation, and in fact it is. Imagine if everything just kept on living, kept on breeding, kept on doing stuff. You know, how problematic would that be if we had about three times as many humans on the planet as we already do? If we had, you know, 10 or 20 or 30 times as many animals on the planet? That sounds like a good idea until you start to realize, where are we going to put everything? Where are those things going to get their resources from? What is a lion going to eat if the high or if the if the uh, the antelope doesn't die? You know, there's, there's there's these basic ideas. Death is a necessary part of creation. But if you if you are humans, try to do that. You probably wouldn't include death as one of the things you'd want to add to creation. We wouldn't think in those terms because death is a loss as far as we understand it. But God understands it differently. He goes on and says, have you understood the expanse of the earth? Tell me if you know all this. What he's saying to him, do you understand how big the earth is? Do you understand all the things that are in it, how it works? Where is the way to the dwelling of the light and darkness? Where is its place? That you may take it to its territory, that you may discern the paths to its home. Light is a fascinating thing. We all use light. We see light. We flip on light switches. We're used to having light. And yet, one of the fascinating things about light is that scientists still don't really understand how it works. They can't even figure out if it's a wave or a particle because it behaves in different ways under different circumstances. It's also the only thing in all of creation that seems to not follow the rules about the, you know, going faster and faster and faster. The speed of light is an absolute constant within the universe. And we don't really understand how that can be possible, but, what's, but, but God understands all of those things. And there's a necessity for light to be the way that it is in order for some of our physical processes to work the way that they do. God continues and he says, has the rain a father? Who has begotten the drops of dew? From whose womb has come the ice and the frost of heaven? Who has, give, who has given it birth? Water becomes hard like stone and the surface of the deep is imprisoned. Water turning into ice is, is, is almost a, a magical process. We know that, that anything, any liquid can freeze into a solid if you make it cold enough, and some do it really easily, and that on the other end of it, that liquids can turn into to, to vapor. But water is unique. Anybody know what's different about water than any other liquid on Earth? Ken does. I'm not going to have you tell us because that, that would just be complicated. But the difference between water, the difference between water and everything else on Earth is that everything else, when it becomes a solid, compacts. It gets smaller. So if you if you have you know um, I'm trying to think of, a, of an example. So molten steel or molten iron, for example, when molten iron is cooled and becomes a solid, it is it takes up less volume than than the, the liquid does. And what that means is that every other liquid material on Earth, when it freezes to a solid, will sink in its own material. So if you have solid iron, it will sink in molten iron. If you have a you know almost any like I said any chemical besides water. When it, when, it, when it freezes, it gets smaller and it sinks. 
Water is unique because water expands. It has to do with the crystalline structure and the alignment of the molecules and stuff that I don't vaguely understand, but I know it's a truth. And it's a really important truth because guess what? If water did what everything else did, the oceans would have frozen into a solid mass a long time ago and nothing could live on this planet. Water is absolutely necessary for the existence of life because water freezes and it floats up to the top, which means that there's still water underneath it. And by the way, the water in the deep oceans is way, way colder than ice on top of them, but it doesn't freeze because of the, the it can't, because of the pressures that exist down there. So life needs water to be different than everything else. And God made water different than everything else. Think about the, the, the thinking that goes into that kind of thing, the planning that goes into that kind of thing, to understand how these things have to work together. And God continues further. He says, can you bind the chains of the, the, chains of the Pleiades, that is a star cluster, or loose the cords of Orion, another star, star cluster? Can you lead forth a constellation in its season and guide the bear with their satellites? Do you know the ordinance of the, of the heavens or fix their rule over the earth? The ordinances of the heavens. What is an ordinance? It's a law. Do you, do you know the laws of the heavens? Well, guess what the primary law of the heavens is? It's called gravity. Guess what? We also don't really understand how it works. Gravity. Gravity. Light. We understand light energy, at least in this sense. We can figure out how it's transmitted. We know how to make it be transmitted. We can't figure out what causes gravity. And you say, well, big stuff. Well, why does big stuff cause gravity? I mean, we're used to that idea. We don't know why that actually works. And so scientists have come up with ideas like, particle called a graviton. The only problem is we can't detect it, we can't see it, we can't notice it. It just works. It just does what it's supposed to do. And what's interesting here is God is saying, I understand this stuff. These things are necessary. Imagine if we didn't have gravity. You know, you'd just float off into space if you weren't paying attention. That's kind of bad because we need oxygen and oxygen is not in space. Oh wait, the oxygen will float off into space too. That'd be kind of bad, right? You know, so th these things that, that we take for granted I mean, and it's so far beyond that. There, there's so many things like this. These things that we take for granted that are inherent in the nature of how things are, every one of these are things that God thought of and worked out as part of creation to make it all work together so that we didn't float off into space, so that we can breathe, so that we can have water to access. All of these things, God thought all of them through. God is the ultimate inventor because he planned all this out. And then there's this, this last cool thing out of that, out of what he talks about to Job. He says, who has put wisdom in the innermost being or given understanding to the mind? Who can count the clouds by wisdom or tip the water jars of the heavens when the dust hardens into a mass and the clouds stick together? And then that last part, he's talking about the way that water works and the way that the ground works. But what I love is that God is basically saying, in my creation, not only did I create all these physical things and make all of them work, but I made you. I made your mind, the human mind, and the way that we think, and our ability to, to, to be rational, our ability to be emotional, our ability to appreciate art, all of those things, those are unique. Those are unusual, and God put those things into us because not only does he understand the physical processes of the earth, he understands our minds. He understands our souls because that's who God is. And so God is the ultimate inventor. And then finally, the last thing we want to look at is that God also maintains the creation. Now, this is not necessarily an assumption that a lot of people make. Historically, one of the most popular alternatives to Christianity or to more organized religions has been deism, which is the idea that, yeah, there's a creator, and yeah, he put everything in motion, but once he did that, he kind of just let it run. And it just goes, it kind of goes on its own. It's like the, the example is the watchmaker who makes the watch and sets it up so that it works and then he sells it to somebody and unless something breaks, he doesn't ever have to go back and do anything with it because it's just going to run on its own. But the scriptures tell us that that's not the nature of God as the creator. God does maintenance on his creation, upkeep, so to speak. Back in Psalm 104 and verse 10, it says, he makes springs pour water into the ravines. Notice earlier there he said, he did this in the past. He did this in the past. This is present tense. He makes springs pour water into the ravines. It flows between the mountains. They give water to all the beasts in the field. The wild donkeys quench their thirst. The birds of the sky nest by the waters and sing among the branches. He waters, present tense, the mountains from his upper chambers. The land is satisfied by the fruit of his work. He makes, he makes grass grow for the cattle and plants for people to cultivate, bringing forth fruit from the earth, wine that gladdens human hearts, oil to make their faces shine, and bread that sustains their hearts. 
God isn't just setting things in motion and letting them run. He is actively continuing to make things happen and work the way that they're supposed to. And because of that, God is the sustainer of creation. He's not just the author. He's not just the inventor. He is the sustainer of, of creation. Psalm 104 continues a little bit later on and says, All creatures look to you to give them their food in the proper time. When you give it to them, they gather it up. When you open your hand, they are satisfied with good things. God is on ongoing process that's giving people and creatures what they need. But the psalmist says, if that doesn't happen, when you hide your face, they are terrified. When you take away their breath, they die and return to the dust. When you send your spirit, they are created and you renew the face of the ground. So what he's saying is, when, the, the, when you withdraw your power, that that's the end of things. When you put it back in, then things are created again. And, and in some ways, this is the cycle of life. But there's a more profound idea that, to the maintenance that God performs on creation. And we see this over in Job chapter 12, where one of the philosophers that Job was talking to says, who among, who among all these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this? And whose hand is the life of every living thing and the breath of all mankind? See, he's not just talking about that, that God put the breath into us. He's saying God holds it in his hand. God continues to make it work the way it's, that it's supposed to work. Over in Job 34, a different philosopher says, Who gave him, that is God, authority over the earth? Who has laid on him the whole world? If he should determine to do so, he if he should gather to himself his spirit and his breath, all flesh would perish together and man would return to dust. See, what he's saying is if God withdraws his power, if God withdraws that maintenance, then the world falls apart. Then life comes to an end. And, 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 and that's not just a, we're not just talking in a, in like a hypothetical kind of thing. This is really what the scriptures tell us. Over in Colossians chapter 1, speaking about Jesus and his role in creation, Paul says, by him, all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. In him all things hold together. Not just spiritual things, but the physical creation sticks together because God made it and continues to make it stick together. It's an interesting thing scientists have, have discovered, or at least they think they have. We run into the same problem, but we can't really detect these things. But scientists have, have, and, and astronomers in particular have the ability to figure out, based on the way that planets and uh, stars and even galaxies operate, you can get a sense of what forces are acting on them. You can't always see those forces. We can't see gravity, but you, you understand that when a pencil falls, gravity is working on it. Well, it's the same basic principle across the board. Gravity, because, because we also know how to calculate the effect of gravity based on the size of planets and the mass of stars and things like that. We can do ca calculations and we, we can figure out what the galaxies and the stars and all those things, what they should be doing. And what's interesting is that scientists over time have found that the galaxies don't do what they should be doing based on the matter that we can actually see and the energy that we can actually perceive in the universe. And what they've come to believe is that there's something called dark energy and dark matter that make up a significant portion of the universe. And when I say a significant portion, I mean 95% or more of all of the universe, scientists think, is made up of stuff that cannot be perceived and cannot be measured in any way other than by the effect that it has on the universe. What does that sound like to you? It sounds like God holding things together and making them move the way that they need to, even in ways that we can't see or understand. And here again, science is showing us the hand of God. Without showing us the hand of God, he's showing the hand of God moving things around to where they need to be. Because that's what God does. He maintains his creation. He sustains his creation. So what is the point of all this? Well, I want us to understand some, some basic principles about God. I told you one already, which is that God is a God of order. Not just a God of order, but he's a God of detail. God doesn't overlook things. He doesn't make mistakes. He doesn't have to form a hypothesis and test it out and see what's going to happen. He knows how to make it. He makes it, and he makes it work the way it's supposed to work. The second thing I want us to understand is that creation is a universal thing. God made everything. The scriptures are very clear about that. He made everything on this physical earth. He made everything in the heavens. And I mean, in this context, I mean the spiritual realms. He made everything. Nothing that exists exists except that God made it. 
And the final thing that I want us to understand, and this is really important, it ties into that role, his role as sustainer, is that God is a good God, a good creator, not a capricious one. Can you imagine if you had an all-powerful God who just liked to mess around with people? That would, that would suck. I mean, that would, that would be awful to live in a you know, creation where the creator was constantly just fooling around with you. God is a good God. His creation is ordered. It is predictable. It is understandable because God wants us to be able to be confident, to know that he is a faithful God. We're going to talk about that later on. To know that he's a good God and not a God who just tinkers around with people for his own amusement. That's not the kind of God that we have. And indeed, the psalmist says, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. God's creation brings glory to him because it shows him as the creator. It shows him as the author, as the inventor, as the sustainer of creation. We can see those things in him, and we can understand something about his nature from what he's created. And God is, as the scriptures talk about, he is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning of creation. He is also the end of creation. Now, usually when we use that term, the end of creation, what we're talking about is the end of time and the destruction of this existing universe and replacement with a heavenly one. But the term end can also mean the goal of creation, the focus of creation. And the interesting thing is that God is, in fact, the focus of creation. But within that creation, there's one particular thing that God created that has a special focus on us. I'm giving it game away right there. has a special focus on it, and that is us, humanity. If you look over at Genesis chapter 1 towards the end of that, it says, God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So what the scriptures tell us is that unlike everything else where God just made this stuff, man was made unique. Man was made in God's image, in God's likeness. And the scriptures teach us very clearly that God is spirit. He's not physical, which means that we were not made like, like my body doesn't look like God's body because God doesn't have a body. We were made in God's image from a spiritual standpoint. Later on in the Genesis account, in Genesis chapter 2, it kind of clarifies this. It says, the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. And that term living being is probably more accurately, or at least as accurately translated, living soul. But none of the animals had the breath of life breathed in them. They still, they're alive, they breathe. But this breath of life is something special. This is God's gift to us of a spirit, of a soul, of moral agency and the ability to make moral choices, something that nothing else in creation has. <clears throat> kind of has that because God breathed his spirit into us and made us in his likeness. And because of that, God is referred to by the Jews as Adonai Asinu, the Lord our maker. It's taken from Psalm 95, which says, Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker, for he is our God. God is our maker, and we are made special and different from the rest of creation. Why? Why are we special and different? Why, for that matter, why was creation done at all? What's the purpose of creation? That's a question that a lot of people have asked over time. And one of the most troubling questions about it is, why would God create the world when he knew, and why, specifically, why would he create man when he knew what a mess man was going to make of things? I mean, look at, look at the how messed up the world. For one thing, everything that's wrong with the world begins with sin because the curses that fell on the earth after Adam and Eve's sin is what broke a lot of the stuff. The reasons we have hurricanes and typhoons and earthquakes and mudslides, and all, that's because sin broke the world as a curse from God. So there's that right off the bat. So creation got messed up by the first two people that God put into it. That's fantastic, right? But he knew they were going to do that because the scriptures tell us that even before the beginning of the earth, Jesus was set aside and given that job of being the savior of the earth, so God knew that was going to happen. And, and because he is all-knowing, he knows all the things that are going to happen or that have happened since then. He knew it before they happened. All the sins of mankind, all of the horrible things that were going to happen throughout all of history, he knew all of those things. And, and, and surely he also knew, knows, 
that the vast majority of people who come into this life are going to end up in hell as a consequence of the choices that they're going to make and the failure to, to go to God and to have that relationship with him through Jesus. And yet God still made the universe and made the world and made man and put him in it. And the question we might reasonably ask is, why in the world did he do that? Why, why would he do something like that when, when, when the consequences seem to be so incompatible with his nature and with what he would want? And the best answer I can come up with, it derives from over in Psalm chapter 8, where the psalmist says, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? In a way, the psalmist is asking that same question. Why, why, why are we important at all? Why did you do this? He goes on and says, you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You made him ruler over the works of your hands and put everything under his feet. The, the, the psalmist basically says, look, you made us special. You made us in your image. We are a little lower than heavenly beings. We don't have the power of heavenly beings. But the thing that we have that's different than everything else in creation is that we have moral agency. We can choose to do right or choose to do wrong. And the psalmist continues and says, you made him over, put him in charge of everything. All the flocks and herds, the animals of the wild, the birds of the sky, all that's run in the paths of the sea. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And when you put all that together, what you start to realize is that God created, not because God happened to feel like creating on a given day, but God is the creator. And one of the things that we're going to see as we go through the study of God is that God doesn't so much do things as he is things. God is omnipotent. He is the expression of what power is. He is omniscient. He is the expression, the, the, the definition of what knowledge is. He is omnipresent. He is the definition of what presence is in all places at all times. God is the creator. That doesn't mean that he creates because it amuses him. It is his nature to create. Creation is, is what he does. And just as we seek to create things, whether it's creating children or whether it's creating artwork or whether it's you know, creating woodwork or whatever it is, God is the ultimate expression of that. And so God created the world because that is his nature as the creator. But here's the thing. When you can make anything happen with your word alone, creation isn't actually all that meaningful in and of itself, is it? I mean, that would be like me just sitting around and daydreaming because the only difference is that I can't turn my daydreams into the reality, that God can. But in and of itself, creation of the universe would not be all that special if something hadn't been created that was unique, that God couldn't absolutely control. And that's us. That's why we have moral agency because the one thing that God can create that can actually give him glory beyond just its existence is us. Because we are able to recognize the existence of God and to give him glory. And so I think God created us because as the creator, he needed, it was fundamental to his nature to create something meaningful. And meaningful comes through our recognition of God's role in creation. For our, through our understanding of him as God and for, from us giving him honor. And that's why the psalmist starts off with the question of, why did you do this? It ends with, O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Because the psalmist recognizes that the purpose of mankind is to bring glory to God. And we do that by honoring him as God, by recognizing him as the creator. And this is what happens at the end of time, that omega in Revelation, when the creatures that are around the, the throne there in the scene of Revelation, they begin to praise God and they say, Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and because of your will they existed and were created. Creation honors God, but if it weren't for us, that honor would be sort of a meaningless thing. We are created. We exist to honor God, and we exist so that God can have a relationship <laughs> with us as that creator. And so my message to you today, the lesson I want to leave you with, is I want you to understand a little bit about how remarkable creation really is and what it would take to make something as complex as our universe and our world and our individual persons to make those things work. But more than all of that, I want you to understand and, and, and realize that your purpose, first and foremost, in your existence is to bring glory to God by honoring him as God 
and by living up to the expectations that he has for us. And we all fall short of those expectations, every single one of us. But every day we try to get a little better, to bring glory to God, and to give him the honor that he deserves. Let's stand and sing. I'm satisfied with just trying to be low, a little silver and a little gold, but in that city where the reds will shine, I want a gold one that's still Yes, girl.